Thanks very much, Lori, uh, for inviting me to present here and, and for organizing this forum. I think it's a, it's a great idea. So I'm a macroeconomist here at the business school, and one of the topics that I'm interested in is this idea of, of institutional change. So wh why do some societies, how do polit political institutions and economic institutions change over time? And in particular, what I'm going to talk about today is the question of whether economic development can actually drive political change. Uh, if uh, you read the news recently, uh, it looks like there's a possibility of some serious uh, regime change, particularly in the Middle East. And uh, we see the protests in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen. Uh, there's some uh, protests in, in Jordan. Um, is this going to lead to change, actual change in, uh, in uh, the types of regimes? So these regimes are, are, auto, are autocratic. Do, do we expect there to be a democracy here? This is a question that uh, is not just important for the, the lives of millions of people, but it's also important if you're trying to tr uh, figure out uh, how, how to do business in, in these societies. And it's very clear that this type of, uh, these types of situations are extremely disruptive. So what, what drives this? If you look historically, there's lots and lots of instances of movements away from autocracy towards democracy that have been successful and sustainable. Uh, the quintessential example of this is uh, the French Revolution, of course, up there. But there are many other examples, like the Solidarity Movement in, in uh, Poland, the uh, uh, movement towards away from dictatorship in, in, in Argentina, uh, and uh, and more, rec uh, more recently the, the end of the Suharto regime in, in, in Indonesia. On the flip side, though, the, these exact same transitions away from autocracy towards uh, democracy have been counterbalanced by uh, uh, historical transitions towards dictatorship. So here we have the, the uh, most common, famous example, of course, is the rise of the ta totalitarian, sta totalitarian state of Nazi Germany, uh, Pinochet, uh, Mugabe. Actually, when Mugabe first took power, uh, Zimbabwe was very democratic and then slowly transitioned out of, into a more autocratic state. We had the more recent coup in Thailand. Um, what, we can, uh, what a lot of uh, economists and political scientists have done is to look at this, uh, this more systematically. So there are many different measures of, uh, of democracy in there, out there. I don't, wanna, I don't have time to discuss how people measure them, but there's a whole bunch of measures. And uh, if you look at the evolution of democracy, uh, it's, the interesting thing about it is that democracy is actually something that we all take for granted. But oh, 300 years ago, we all, everybody lived effectively in an autocracy. It's a new phenomenon, this idea of democracy. And in fact, if you look at the trend, uh, this is different baskets of countries. I looked at some Asian countries, uh, o OECD countries, and Latin America. Uh, you can see that there has been an overall trend uh, towards uh, more democracy around the world. Uh, but all of these trends have been counterbalanced by reverse trends and coups over time. Okay, so, uh, so, so we have data out there on democracy, and, 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 and we see these trends. Now, there, a lot of people have uh, wondered why, what is it that actually drives this type of political change? And if you have a democracy, what can preserve it? Okay? And the most common and famous uh, theory uh, behind this is, the, is called the modernization hypothesis and the modernization view. It's the idea that economic growth and uh, education can actually promote democracy. It's maybe something that you yourselves uh, believe, uh, but it's also uh, the, the, the origin of this idea is due to Aristotle and uh, more recently has been discussed by, by this po famous political scientist, uh, Martin Lipset. It's not just an academic issue. It's actually uh, widely believed by many policymakers and it embedded in the, in, the, uh, in the directives of many different or uh, aid organizations. But FDR, for instance, uh, stated that democracy cannot succeed unless those who express their choice are prepared to choose wisely. The real safeguard of democracy, therefore, is education. Uh, the, Millennium Corp, uh, Challenge Corporation effectively believes in giving aid to countries that aid and uh, the preservation of democracy, economic growth and the preservation of, democ of democracy go hand in hand, and these are complementary goals. Okay? And, and, and in other words, economic growth can help to sustain and promote democracy. Okay? And this is a very common view. Uh, what I'm going to show you is uh, why people believe this view, and then I'm going to show you why uh, people are wrong in believing that this is true. Okay? So, let me show you why people believe this view. Uh, people believe this view because of figures like this. So if you look, at, uh, if you look around the world, and this is a pattern that you, any, at any moment in time, you look at this pattern and you're going to find it. So you look at income per capita here on the x-axis. You look at a measure of democracy on the y-axis. And lo and behold, what do you find? Rich countries have higher democracy scores. And this is true in whichever way you measure democracy. In other words, there's more political freedom in richer societies. You look at Western Europe. You look at U.S., high, higher political freedom than in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, which are poor. Okay, so, uh, so th some people see this and say, oh, this looks like, uh, like being rich helps to sustain democracy. 
Uh, you can draw a similar plot where I replace income per capita by total years of schooling or other measures of education. And you'll see that, again, places that, are, uh, that, that have higher rates of e levels of education also are more, are, uh, have higher levels of democracy. Uh, the other thing we can look at is, besides looking at these just raw correlations, is to look at which countries experience actual political change. So, for instance, let's say that we look at, uh, at autocracies, and let's look at which autocracies are still autocratic five years later. Okay? And that's what we do here, and we say let's look at autocracies which have income per capita above the world mean, and look at autocracies that have income per capita below the world mean. And it turns out that autocracies that have income per capita above the world mean are more likely to transition into democracies. Okay, so, this, so you're more likely to experience political change if you're richer relative to the rest of the world. Uh, analogously, let's look at, the, at, at uh, democracies. Okay, so let's look at all of the democracies around the world and let's see which ones of these turn out and experience a coup and transition into, democracy, into uh, dictatorships five years later. And uh, guess what? If, if democracies are poorer relative to the rest of the world, they also are more likely to experience transitions out of uh, out of democracy and experience the uh, dictatorship. Okay, so if you see, all of this evidence is the evidence that has been used to, to uh, argue that it is in fact the case that the economic development fosters democracy, preserves democracy. It's something that, uh, 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 that is good for democracy. And in other words, if you look at China, eventually China will become democratic. That's one natural extension of this argument because China is growing astronomically fast. The problem with this, which is what, uh, what me and uh, together with a group of co-authors argue, is that uh, this is not really uh, the argument of this, of this modernization hypothesis. If you really believe this, you would, uh, you would uh, want to see actual examples of countries where economic growth has come together hand in hand with an improvement in democracy. What, all of this is based on this cross-country variation. And the, the real question is, is it the case that economic growth has tended to foster democracy historically? Is it the case that economic growth also has preserved democracies and actually, uh, and actually uh, uh, stopped them from, uh, from ex experiencing coups and, and uh, becoming autocracies? And so what we do in the study is look at, at the variation within countries. And when we look at this variation, we don't find any evidence whatsoever of, of this modernization view. Okay, so let me show you the, uh, this evidence here. So this, this figure is very much like the previous figure I showed you, except that rather than looking at levels, I'm looking at changes. And I just chose some dates, but the picture looks the same, however you choose the dates here. Where what, I've, what, what you have here on the x-axis is the change in income per capita over time, so economic growth. And what you have here on the y-axis is a change in the, in the democracy score, so political development. And there is no relationship whatsoever between economic growth and, and political development. Look at countries like China and Singapore, some of the fastest growing countries in the world, don't have any change whatsoever in their political institutions. Also, you have some countries that do experience improvements and, 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 and do experience coups, but it has nothing to do whatsoever with their economic development. So, that's, so it doesn't seem like there's any evidence of this. Analogously, let's look at uh, changes in education. If you look at, uh, uh, at, at growth in uh, years of schooling in the population, look at whether that is related to change in, uh, in, politi in the political rights index. There is, again, no association. You have some countries like Iran, for instance, over this time period from 1970 to 1995, experienced a slight deterioration in, its politi in political freedom, but lots of improvement in education relative to the rest of the world, but you don't see any, any uh, movement towards uh, uh, democracy in Iran. So there's no evidence when you look at these changes. Analogously, I can show you these same exact plots as we had before, where rather than comparing a country's income uh, relative to the rest of the world, we can compare a country's income to where its income per capita normally is. Okay, so let's look at the entire group of autocracies out there and ask the question, is it the case that if this autocracy is richer than usual, that it is more likely to subsequently experience a transition towards democracy? So that's what, that's what this asks here. And if, the, if this autocracy has a higher income relative to, to, its normal, to, to its mean, it actually has virtually the same probability of transitioning into a democracy as, as uh, whether it would have a low income per capita. And the same exact uh, is, thing is true if you look at, at democracies and see, is it the case that if a democracy actually has lower income uh, uh, relative to where its income normally is, that it's more likely to also experience uh, a breakdown of order and a coup 
uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that that uh, uh, that uh, lower income can actually that higher income preserves the democracy and makes it less likely to break down and, and experience a coup. So, the bottom line is of this is that economic growth and education do not promote democracy. Uh, the views that were expressed by very, by by uh, you know the by various organizations and politicians is actually is actually wrong. Uh, there is one thing that we do in in addition, which uh, which I, I don't have time to get into, which is to why how come it's the case? It is kind of still puzzling that the richest countries do happen to have the highest uh, scores in democracy. So how come it is the case that the U.S., Western Europe are very rich and have the, and are democratic? The reason why this is puzzling is because at some point in time, a long, long time ago. Uh, everybody lived in a very poor autocracy, okay, with the exception of, of Roman times. But effectively, uh, we all lived in, uh, everybody was poor. And some countries took off, experienced high rates of economic growth in other countries, stag uh, and that came along with democratization in other countries stagnated. And uh, what we, uh, and our, and what we um, think is the possible explanation for this is that uh, these two, uh, political development and economic development, are deeply intertwined. And it doesn't really have anything to do with one causing the other, but uh, it has to do with various experiences. So for example, uh, some, some countries uh, were, for example, Protestant countries were more likely to experience simultaneously both higher rates of economic growth, higher, uh, 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 faster transitions towards democracy relative to Muslim countries, and this is something. And, and these uh, these features, whether the religion that's in place or maybe the types of colonization experiences of a country, simultaneously cause both. But it's not that economic development is actually promoting democracy or sustaining democracies. And we do various types of tests, and we show that that this is a likely explanation of what's going on. So, in conclusion, economic development does not promote political development. Uh, one of the policy implications of this is that if you are, if we are interested in uh, in promoting democracy, which was has been the uh, in the interest of various different administrations in the U.S., this has to be more direct. It's not a byproduct of economic development. There are a lot of outstanding questions uh, that that are useful to think about, which is what actually, if this is not going to be the recipe for promoting democracy, what actually does work and what is going to help to uh, sustain it. And also, another interesting thing to think about is how come you. How come you have these sparks in the world, like what happened, what's happening right now, and what explains these types of re regional trends? That is, that's a, an interesting question, and I don't think we understand that very well. Okay, so that's that's it. Thanks very much.